and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing fountain of redeeming grace that is there for us in your love for us through your son Jesus and his death at the cross in our place. His blood flowed, and from that flow, we have everything we need. And we give thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you an explanation and a reminder of what this next part of our worship is together. It's the Lord's Supper, and it resembles a meal, the meal that Jesus had with his disciples on his last night with them. It resembles the bread and the wine that they had together. The bread is a symbol, and it reminds us of Jesus' body that was given for us in our place at the cross in his death. And the juice that we'll drink is a symbol, and it reminds us of his blood that was shed in our place as a sacrifice to purchase our salvation, uh, the forgiveness of sins. And God's intent with this remembrance is that we, who are believers in Jesus Christ, that we would humble ourselves and confess our sins and turn from them and rest in his death that secures us in God's love. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, trusting in him alone for forgiveness of sins, then we invite you to eat and drink with us to remember our Savior who died for us. If this morning, by your own admission, you're not trusting in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, then let the tray of the bread and the juice pass you by and instead consider your need for a Savior. His name is Jesus, and he is your only hope. So let's take our Bibles and let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 20. We have some men who are going to make their way up the aisles with the Bibles. If you do not have one, please just put your hand in the air, and they will make sure that you get one, and turn to Ezekiel chapter 20. It's that very crispy, white, untouched page in your Bible. This is an important chapter in your Bible that provides helpful details of what God was like with Israel in her early days as a slave nation in Egypt. And it provides details all the way to what God will be like toward Israel when he finally restores her to himself in Messiah Jesus one day. God's character as a gracious redeemer is on full display in Ezekiel 20, and this will help us to remember Jesus as we should. Notice with me first in verse 8. Even though Israel was only unfaithful to Yahweh while they were slaves in Egypt, and even though God was provoked to destroy them in Egypt, he did not. Look at verse 8. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But why did he not? Verse 9, but I acted for the sake of my name. God did not take into consideration their reputation, their unfaithfulness, but he considered his own name, his own reputation, and he acted according to his reputation as a redeemer. He had made promises long ago to them that he still desired to keep. His character as a gracious redeemer was at stake, and that's what moved him to spare them in Egypt. Next, we move out into Israel's early days in the wilderness. Notice, secondly, in verse 13, that even though the older generation of Israel in the wilderness continued on in their unfaithfulness to him, and even though God was provoked to destroy them, he did not. Verse 13, but the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes, and they rejected my ordinances, by which, if a man observes them, he will live. And my Sabbath they greatly profaned. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness to annihilate them. But he didn't. Why? Verse 14. But I acted for the sake of my name. Look at verse 17. Yet my eyes spared them rather than destroying them, and I did not cause their annihilation in the wilderness. 
Again, he took into consideration not their reputation, not their unfaithful character, but instead he considered his own reputation, and that moved him to act and to spare them. His reputation as a gracious redeemer was at stake still, and he spared them. Later in the very same wilderness, notice this in verse 21. Even though the younger generation appeared to not have learned anything from the nation's prior unfaithfulness, and even though God was again provoked to destroy them, he did not. Verse 21. But the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes, nor were they careful to observe my ordinances by which if a man observes them, he will live. They profaned my Sabbath, so I resolved to pour out my wrath on them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. But he did not. Why? Verse 22. But I withdrew my hand and acted for the sake of my name. Yet again, God took into consideration his own character as a gracious redeemer. He did not act on the basis of their unfaithfulness. Instead, He spared them. One last time, verse 42. Even though their long history in the promised land was marked primarily by unfaithfulness to Yahweh all the way up to their exile, and even though the Lord scattered them in judgment into the nations, God still says he will one day be gracious to them rather than destroy them. Look at verse 42. And you will know that I am Yahweh when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the land which I swore to give to your forefathers. There you will remember your ways and all your deeds with which you have defiled yourselves, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for all the evil things that you have done. And notice again that God will be moved to act according to his gracious redeemer character and not act according to their unfaithfulness. Verse 44, then you will know that I am Yahweh when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways or according to your corrupt deeds, O house of Israel, declares the Lord Yahweh. This is what our heavenly father is like toward us in Jesus Christ. God was always this way with Israel as they awaited their Messiah, and God will be this very same way with them in a day that is yet to come when he restores them to himself through Yahweh. And our only hope for salvation from God's wrath is if he will take his character and his reputation into consideration and not our evil deeds or corrupt deeds. And here's how that worked at the cross. Jesus robed himself at the cross in our evil ways, even though he himself only was ever holy in all of his ways. And at the cross, he also willingly robed himself in our corrupt deeds, even though he had only ever done pure deeds. Our only hope for salvation from God's wrath is if he will not take our character into reputation and our reputation into consideration. And so there at the cross, as our substitute, God acted toward Jesus in judgment on the basis of our evil ways and corrupt deeds. Looking at Jesus, God took into consideration our unfaithfulness and he crushed Jesus in our place. Why? So God could act toward us according to his own namesake, according to his reputation as a just God and a redeeming, gracious God. Believer, remember that our substitute died in our place this morning. God judged him as our sins deserved so that God could show us mercy and forgiveness according to his reputation as a gracious redeemer. Remember this great love that God has for you in Christ. And in light of this mercy received, confess your sins. Confess any unfaithfulness that you know to God this morning 
and map out your flight from it this morning into faithful, obedient living. And even this week, see God's gracious Redeemer character as a fountain for your soul. Paul said in Romans 8, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. That's what we just saw. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? All of your other needs that you must have met to, find, uh, to live a, a life of faithfulness to God will flow from his redeeming grace. Restraining grace from sin flows from redeeming grace at the cross. So come back to this fountain daily this week. The men will come to serve you the bread and the cup, and when you have prepared your heart, please take the bread and the cup on your own, and Jacob will be up shortly to close our remembrance in prayer. Men, please serve us.